this is our second video about uh, wind turbines. In the previous video, we talked about uh, wind turbine as a uh, energy conversion system that converts the kinetic energy of the air molecules in the in the wind into electricity. For any kind of energy conversion system, the most important aspect that we are concerned about is probably the conversion efficiency, which is the ratio between the total amount of useful energy output and the total amount of energy input. Higher energy efficiency, higher conversion efficiency, translates directly into lower energy cost for the consumers. From the first law of thermodynamics, we know that energy is always conserved during any kind of a conversion. So the total energy output, including the useful energy output and the energy loss, is always equal to the total energy input. So what makes the energy conversion coefficient eta deviate from unity is actually the keyword useful. The exact meaning of usefulness depends upon the purpose of the conversion device. If the device is a natural gas furnace, The useful energy output is heat, and the energy input is the chemical energy in the natural gas. A light bulb can also produce heat. But the purpose of a light bulb is to produce light. So the heat produced by the light bulb is not useful energy. For turbines used in electricity generation, whether it is a wind turbine, or a steam turbine, or some kind of a water turbine. The useful energy output is the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft. Sometimes we call it shaft work or technical work. When we are considering only useful energy output, the efficiency is limited not only by our, by our engineering capabilities, but also by some inherent or thermodynamic constraints. For the wind turbine, there is an upper bound of the efficiency of converting the kinetic energy in the wind to the mechanical energy of the shaft, which we call Betz limit. And it is a little bit less than 60%. We will discuss the Betz limit in later videos. Modern wind turbines can usually achieve, can often achieve 45% to 50% of efficiency, which is actually quite close to this uh, theoretical limit. In a conventional power plant, there are usually three conversions three, done by like done by three devices. In the in the in the boiler, in the boiler, the chemical energy, either in coal or in oil, or in natural gas, is converted into heat to boil water. The steam, the steam, the steam turbine, the steam turbine, then converts the heat in those pressurized water steam into the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft, which in turn drives a generator, which converts the mechanical energy of the rotating shaft into electricity. The boiler and the generator has have very high conversion efficiency, which are almost close to 100%. But the steam turbine has a much lower efficiency when converting the heat into mechanical energy. In practice, in coal, a coal-fired power plant can convert about 29% to 37% of the chemical energy in the coal into electricity. And a natural gas power plant can convert about 32% to 50% of the chemical energy in the gas into electricity. The reason that the conversion of the natural gas has a higher overall conversion efficiency is because the burning of the gas is more complete than the burning of a solid coal. So why different types of conversions have different efficiencies. And more fundamentally, 
is it ever possible to remove those thermodynamic constraints that limit the efficiency? So the study of the conversion from mechanical energy to heat started quite early. The American-born English physicist Benjamin Thompson, who was later called uh, Count Rumford, did some experiments in 1798. At that time, Count Rumford was in charge of boring cannons. The horses were turning some kind of a uh, device that drove a bit, drove a drilling bit, into the uh, cannon cast. And he noticed that the shavings, those shavings that's coming out of the cannon were really hot. So there must be some kind of conversion from mechanical energy produced by those horses and the turning bit uh, and, and the uh, 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 boring device into heat. And he later even demonstrated that the mechanical work of the horses could be used to boil water in the tub without fire. So this is actually a replica of his 1978 uh, experiment. So you can see the horses. And the horses is actually driving a rotating shaft. And that rotating shaft is driving a bit, a drilling bit, into this, uh, this cannon cast. And here he was sitting and watching the water. A basket of uh, a basin of water is being boiled by the heat generated from uh, the mechanical energy. So at that time it was actually a quite remarkable experiment. And uh, he has a thesis. He has a uh, he has a publication that's called "Heat is a Form of Motion," an experiment in boring cannon, and it was published. Uh, back in like, 1798. Um, in 1845, English physicist uh, James Joule designed a paddle wheel device, a paddle wheel device, this kind of device. This device allowed him to make quite accurate measurements of both the mechanical energy and the heat generated. So, so you can sort of see there's a big cylinder here, right? And this cylinder is filled with a syrup or some kind of a viscous fluid. And this cylinder is called a calorimeter. It allows you to actually measure heat, basically. And you have a pedal inside of it, right? And then you have a thermometer that's coming out of it, right? So when the pedal actually rotates, inside of the fluid, mechanical energy is converted into heat and the thermometer can tell the temperature increase. And then the pedal inside of this calorimeter is actually driven by a folding mass, a folding weight. And uh, the potential energy of this folding weight can actually be measured by using a ruler. So basically, just to measure the, 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 the distance, the height, the weight has dropped. And then from that, you can calculate the potential uh, energy lost by this weight. And what Jules has found, found is that the potential energy lost during the fall of the weight of the mass was almost exactly the same as the heat captured by the calorimeter. So if you design your device carefully, the conversion from mechanical energy to heat can be very efficient. That is, the conversion efficiency is almost close to 100%. So if we look at this table again, if we look at this table again, the natural gas furnace, which converts chemical energy that's stored in the natural gas into heat, also has a very, very high conversion efficiency, close to 100%. If you have an electric heater, which essentially converts electricity to heat, you will notice that it also has a conversion efficiency very close to 100%. So if the conversion from other forms of energy into heat is so efficient, why the opposite of conversion? For example, the conversion from heat to mechanical energy here in the steam turbine 
is much lower. So, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, um, people are sort of designing all kinds of machines. Last time we talked about the perpetual motion machines of the first kind. This time we're going to talk about the perpetual motion machines of the second kind. Those machines were designed uh, as some kind of a heat engine. What exactly is a heat engine? A heat engine is a machine that converts heat into mechanical energy. Right? The steam turbine is an example of a heat engine. In the past, inventors have proposed heat engines that could take heat from a single heat reservoir and then convert it completely into mechanical work, reaching 100% of conversion efficiency. Today, we call this kind of machine perpetual motion machines of the second kind. One example of those perpetual motion machines of the second kind is the ammonia motor or zero motor proposed by John Gemji in 1880. This kind of machine, right? In the ammonia motor, there is a heat reservoir filled with liquid ammonia. Liquid ammonium boils at minus 33 degrees Celsius. So at ambient temperature, for example, 20 degrees or something, it would be vaporized and produce a vapor pressure of about four atmosphere, which can be used to drive a piston. If the mechanical work done is equivalent to the heat from the reservoir, it does not violate the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. So it's not a perpetual motion machine of the, sec of, of the first kind. As the vapor expanded, it would cool and condense and return to the reservoir for the next cycle. The problem with this design is that the ammonia vapor cannot expand and cool to the temperature of con condensation due to the resistance of the piston. And the heat cannot flow spontaneously from the cooler ammonium vapor to the hotter ambient environment. So for the ammonium to be condensed to the liquid state, there must be an active refrigeration process, which actually requires more energy than the engine is capable of generating. So perpetual motion machine of the second kind don't work. And the work of Sadi Carnot, who was a uh, French military engineer, actually have proved that the perpetual motion of machine of the second kind are impossible. And his work also laid the foundation for the second law of thermodynamics. What he found was that in order to extract the mechanical work from a hot heat reservoir, for example, a hot reservoir here, right, it has a temperature of Th, you must, you must dump some residual heat into a colder reservoir. So one heat reservoir with just a high temperature doesn't work. You must have two heat reservoirs with different temperature in order to actually extract useful mechanical work out of the heat uh, from the hot uh, reservoir. So the conversion efficiency of a heat engine, which is today we call it a Carnot efficiency, is actually the ratio. Is actually the ratio between the temperature difference of the hot and the cold uh, heat reservoir, and the temperature of the hot reservoir. And because because the temperature of the cold reservoir can never reach absolute absolute zero zero Kelvin, which is about minus 273 degrees Celsius. And also because the temperature of the hot reservoir can never reach infinity. So the Carnot efficiency, the efficiency, the inherent efficiency of any kind of heat engine can never reach 100%. And in practice, the cold reservoir is usually uh, uh, is usually the ambient environment basically. So T sub C is actually fixed at the ambient temperature, which is about 25 degrees Celsius. So in this particular graph, 
20 degrees or 25 degrees Celsius is about 295 Kelvin, right? So this this figure this figure basically shows you how the conversion efficiency actually changes with TH because TC the temperature of the cold reservoir is fixed at 298 degrees Celsius a uh, degree uh, Kelvin 298 uh, Kelvin right so it's gonna it, as you raise TH the efficiency can approach unity but you can never get there and in practice most of the today, mo most of the uh, contemporary technology can actually usually reach TH to about 500 Kelvin which is about 227 degrees Celsius so the conversion efficiency so the conversion efficiency is uh, around 40 percent so around 40 percent and which is actually consistent with the numbers we're giving here the steam turbine that goes from that converts heat from uh, that converts heat to mechanical energy usually it can reach like 40 to 45 percent of a, a conversion efficiency so there are Carnot's work laid the foundation to the second law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics actually has um, uh, how do I say it's uh, it's, uh, it's got different uh, there are different ways of stating the second law of thermodynamics the closest statement uh, is quite intuitive it is impossible to transfer heat from a cooler to a hotter body spontaneously if you want to do that you have to spend extra energy and uh, the device is called a refrigerator right refrigerator basically transfers heat from a cooler to a hotter body it transforms heat from the food inside of the refrigerator to the hotter uh, hotter environment that's the kitchen right the kelvin planck statement basically tells us that the, the perpetual motion machine of the second kind is impossible and then after the introduction of the concept of entropy the Planck statement widely cited in modern literature states that the entropy of an isolated system always increases we have to sort of pay attention to the keyword isolated here right um, because we, in practice we do see entropy decreasing right for example we can make um, an iPhone case from aluminum ore right aluminum ore has um, so, so we know that the aluminum ore must have a higher entropy than the iPhone case, right? So, so we do see a uh, processes that actually decrease entropy, but that's because this process is not an isolated, is not happening an isolated process, uh, isolated environment. An isolated system is a system that has no mass and no energy transfer with the surrounding environment so if you consider the entire universe the entropy of the entire universe is always increased right when you actually convert the aluminum ore to an iPhone case you are reducing the, the entropy in the iPhone case right but you're actually increasing more entropy in the surrounding environment right so so that's sort of the that's sort of the the the, the, the most widely accepted uh, statement uh, in modern literature, right? Using the definition of entropy, and entropy is a concept that's being introduced in order to actually quantify or describe in a quantitative way the second law of thermodynamics. Right? Because all natural processes have a tendency to increase the entropy, so energy conversions that conform to this tendency are usually easier and have higher conversion efficiencies while energy conversions going against this natural tendency are more difficult and have lower conversion efficiencies in fact mechanical chemical and the electric energy can all be completely converted into heat while the reverse conversion cannot be fully completed without outside help or without any inevitable without an inevitable loss in conversion efficiencies this is because heat which is associated with the random vibrations of atoms and molecules in a highly disordered fashion is an energy form with higher entropy 
than other three energy forms. So the introduction of entropy effectively provided a way for us to assign equality to different energy forms. Conversions from high quality energy to low quality energy are easier and more efficient than conversions from low quality energy to high quality energy. The kinetic energy of the air molecules in the wind is in fact a high entropy energy source because of the high variabilities of wind speed over space and time. In particular, the, exist the existence of turbulences increases the entropy. You can imagine all the air molecules, they are statistically or on average moving in some consistent direction, but in reality, lots of those air molecules are actually uh, have random vib vibrations and random uh, directions. So wind turbine is actually converting such a high entropy energy source into the low entropy mechanical energy of the rotating shaft, in which all the molecules in the shaft actually share a common motion in a highly ordered fashion. So the second law of thermodynamics imposes an inherent limit on this particular conversion uh, efficiency. Because of the limitations imposed by the second law, when we are considering the conversion to mechanical energy, a highly useful concept is the so-called exergy, which was introduced in 1956. So it's a relatively new concept. While energy is the ability to either perform work or to generate heat, the exergy is actually the portion of the energy that can perform work. The exergy depends not only on the state of the system itself, but also on the state of the surrounding environment. The exergy efficiency, psi here, right? We can compare that with eta, the energy conversion efficiency. Right? The exergy conversion efficiency is defined as the useful exergy output divided by all XG input. Right. And this XG efficiency is also known as the second law efficiency because the definition of XG actually accounts for entropy. Right. It's a, if you look at the definition of XG, you have a term that's minus temperature uh, times uh, changes in the entropy. Right. So exergy actually is a definition that actually combines both energy and also entropy. So the exergy conversion efficiency is called the second law efficiency. In practice, um, the energy efficiency or the first law efficiency determines the most efficient process based on wasting as little input energy as possible while the exergy efficiency determines the most efficient process based on wasting as little input work or input energy that could be converted into work as possible. Right. So to set up the entire exergy analysis is actually quite a complex task. It's not so easy and it's beyond the scope of this video. But I would like to show a comparison of energy and exergy efficiency as a function of wind speed. For a 100 kilowatt wind turbine in northern Istanbul. So, so this is the diagram. This is the diagram. And the horizontal axis is the wind speed in terms of meter per second. And the vertical axis is either energy or exergy efficiency, right? depending upon uh, different symbols. So those circles, those empty circles, or XG efficiency as a function of wind speed and those dots, those uh, field dots, are energy efficiency as a function of um, wind speed. Right. Um, we can see that there are some slight as overestimation based on energy efficiency alone. Right. Energy efficiency is higher, slightly higher than the XG efficiency. And the, the actual efficiency 
that in terms of the economical sense, in terms of the mechanical energy that we can actually extract from the wind, is actually the XG efficiency. The XG efficiency is something more useful in a practical sense. Right. One conclusion reached by the authors of this work is that uh, XG analysis should be used for wind energy evaluations and assessments to allow for a more realistic modeling, evaluation, and planning for wind energy systems. Um, because of the XG analysis is still at the beginning of its um, development, right? It's relatively the concept is quite late, 1958, right? So in the following videos, I will still follow the conventional analysis based on energy efficiency, right? And we'll talk about best limit. We'll talk about uh, how exactly the wind turbine actually works.